Well, this is it, the very last build video of our King of the Hammers race Jeep series. It has been a very long and wild journey, but it's been a ton of fun taking this 2009 stock Jeep Wrangler and turning it into a full-blown race rig over the course of a little less than a year. So I wanna thank all of y'all for sticking around and you know, hopefully you've enjoyed or learned something from this video series, but this is the last official build video. It is a long one. It's over an hour long, but we packed a ton of projects into it. Really the last 30 days of the build leading up to hammers is all compiled in this video. So sit back, enjoy it, and I'll see you guys at the end. So we are working on the rear upper firewall, getting some Barnes four wheel drive trick tabs welded on and threw in Little rib nuts in there, quarter 20. The ones from Amazon didn't make it in, so tack weld them with the panel on the inside, and now we just gotta fully weld them on the outside. Those are gonna hold up our panel. With the never ending list of projects, it's time to move on to the horn. So Ultra 4 rules say that we have to have some kind of horn set up on the Jeep. That way if we need to notify that we're gonna pass somebody, we just tap the horn. So I ran over to Harbor Freight and picked up some of these super affordable dual horns, 113 decibels, super easy to mount. And as you can tell, just put a little trick tab there. It's gonna thread in right there. And we're gonna do another one on the other side. Oh, Mike just showed up. Just, we're doing some super, super important stuff this morning, but lots of little projects are about to start popping up like this. The last thing we need to do today is gonna be finish up our rear firewall vents for the radiator up there. We have two more to cut out and put the mesh in. So, pretty neat stuff. We're gonna put that up and then once that's up in there, I'm gonna cut out for the seat belts and then put in the, uh, fuel tank, radiator, keep going. We are building the rear bumper now. It's also gonna tie in mostly for the spare tire. We threw it up there, mocked it up. And we're just gonna tie four kickoffs off the rear with a piece of tubing and then come up to our spare tire. So these have all been coped. It's time to measure out and weld.
We had a busy day today finishing off our spare tire holder, but the design is pretty simple. We have our main hoop coming back here off of the C pillar of the cage. Right now we just have one stanchion right here so we can slide a jack in the pocket there. Our tie down straps are the Barnes four wheel drive, uh, just tie down straps and these are the medium size. And those turned out really nice, welded really nice on there. And we paired it with the Max Y tire strap tie down. Now they do come in two different styles, a flat hook like this or a straight hook. So depending on what mounts and where you're going to position it, is going to kind of dictate what kind of hooks you're going to put on there or order from Max or whatever else you choose to go with. So what we also did is add another spreader bar up here. So the weight of the tire is on our rear hoop and our coilover shock spreader tower down there with our reservoirs tucked up underneath, plenty of room for the battery, which we'll talk about in a minute. But to prevent the tire going into the radiator, which was a big tip from uh, Walt over at Mischief Maker. Recommended putting this piece in. A gusset cut out and Mike cut out a nice little saddle just to double up the material thickness that we're pulling from right there. So the weight is on this. Any forward impacts would be spread onto this bar, which we can always add another triangle right here. Over there on that side, we'd have to triangulate it the opposite way because of the fuel fill, but this in my mind, with that there to prevent it from walking forward, the load on here and the position, positioning of the straps should prevent this to want to walk. So this was our next project, the uh, center console. I was originally planning to do, just do like a large dash hoop center console, but for Ultra 4 we have to have a kind of firewall for our fuel or any kind of fluids passing through. This thing needs to be on a trailer and heading west in 28 days and 18 hours. Originally, I was planning on putting all of the other coolers in the front, but I think rear mounted is going to be a better idea. This pocket right here for the trans cooler, it's nice and open. We're not gonna fit anything else in there, so this is perfect for our transmission cooler. Ended up using the TMR Customs. These are the 3 8 threaded trick tabs. Our cooler's good to go. All we gotta do is tack it. I do need to be careful with the cooler fins in there with welding, so I'm just gonna put a little tack in each. And well, now we pull the cooler out, weld these in, and then focus on the lowers. I went ahead and got one set of our coilover reservoir tabs mounted up there. These are the basic ones from, you can get them really anywhere. If you're ever ordering coilovers, get them with AccuTune and get an angled swivel fitting because it allows you to move and swivel your hose as opposed to landing it where it needs to go. So this one wraps over and these tabs get welded on and we use our hose clamp over there and hose clamp it on. Now the rear one, I need to work around our power steering reservoir here. So we go around and it kicks it further back out. So over here we have a set of out of hand fab ones, which are a bolt together design. We're gonna position this, weld this on there. It kicks it far out enough. And realistically, if we have to pop the reservoir off, it's just those four. It is time to get the batteries installed on the Jeep. And when you're choosing a battery for your off-road rig, racing rig, really kind of any motorsport application, a battery can be a make it or break it scenario. So I went with the full throttle battery. They have all different types and styles. This is the FT82534. So it is a group 34 size battery with 825 cold cranking amps. And to make it even better, we are running two of them. 
race jeeps with all i mean there's a lot of coolers a lot of lights and a lot of electrical draw on this rig so choosing a battery that is going to handle hot cold vibration shock load pretty much full dissipation if needed meaning if our alternator goes and we need to rely only on battery we need a battery that can handle that so for ultra four rules we do have to have an agm non-spillable battery and that's really what i would recommend for any kind of sport or scenario where it's going to be a lot of bouncing a lot of vibration and i've ran all kinds of batteries optima odyssey walmart die hard there the list goes on from what i've been seeing the full throttle batteries are honestly some of the best of the best what they do is the lead inside of here and the materials it's actually brand new virgin materials opposed to recycling which some of the other battery manufacturers use but that is enough talking we'll talk about those a little bit more let's go ahead and unbox the other one and get it on the jeep so one thing i really like about these batteries is that we have threaded battery terminals there that we can also convert into our typical acorn style as well so these we can just run a bolt through with a lock washer and we don't have to worry about our battery terminals popping off when we're racing. So that's one neat little feature. Before I go ahead and put this battery in there, we're using the Barnes battery tray and I went ahead and put a little battery foam mat in here. And what this is going to do is just absorb a little bit of the vibration from transferring to the battery and hopefully just prevents this from swelling. So my time in the Coast Guard, I have seen countless AGM batteries where the case actually swelled. And usually it was either due to heat, overcharging, if the uh, generator, the regulator went and started overcharging these, or vibration just from them beating on it out in the ocean, the bumps and everything, the batteries would swell, the case would get stuck in the mount, and you'd have to kind of pry it out. And at that point, you know, it's unsafe. And time to time to trash it and there was a certain brand that we used for warranty in about like three like three a month but in this case i don't want the negative and positive right beside each other it makes it nice for packaging and wiring but just in case our wires did end up touching each other we don't want this battery to short out so i will just flip it around and then what we can do is just have both of these positives come together and put the batteries in parallel. Some people will go even a step further and run like an isolator or a dual battery setup. In our case, I don't think we need that. I think we just need the extra capacity of the amperage of these 825s. Put them in parallel and these should do the trick. Our next project is knocking out our cooling lines. So we are running Dash 20, which is a humongous hose. And what this allows us to do is make our own hose ends. It's reusable and it's a much better connection opposed to just using hose clamps and typical heater hose. So as you can tell, we've already had, already finished them out through the firewall and now we're working on running it up to the engine and dash 20 lines are a pain in the butt, but it's not impossible. So we have some hose here from Aeroflow, which is also known as Auto Plum, as well as their fittings. What we're gonna do, Go ahead and measure how long we need. Mike's gonna cut that in the bandsaw, nice clean cut. You tape it up, that way it doesn't unravel and fray everywhere. So we're gonna cut that and then start assembling a Dash 20 AM fitting. And you're gonna try to stuff this in without fraying it really bad. Once we got all those frays inside, put a little pressure on the hose. And with the Dash 20 lines, you gotta put a ton of pressure. And once it's started, did it start? Yeah, I think so. These have three barbs inside that the hose grabs onto. And the smaller diameter AN fittings, you can just push it on there like we just did. But this big stuff, we gotta bring it over to the wooden bench and slam the crap out of it. And then you can see it's kinda 
working its way in there. Make sure it goes even. We had a nice little AN vice grip tool, and as you can tell, it did not like the Dash 20 stuff and exploded when we were torquing it down. So we have a big adjustable inside of the vise, and it works perfect. At this point, all we're gonna do is tighten it down until this flushes up against here. And that's that. That's how you assemble a Dash 20 fitting. Good luck to anybody that wants to try it. Aftermarket oil pans. It is always imperative you use the correct pickup tube with the oil pan. The one on the right came with the motor. The one on the left comes with the new Holly. As you can tell, we're about two to three inches deeper with this one. Use the correct one. Yeah, that would not be picking up Whoa. too much at all. You don't want to be losing oil pressure out on the race. Nope. So nope. this pan, no way, no. this pan is a little bit different. It is deeper than the stock LS3 pan. You know, we do lose a little bit of ground clearance, but it's still above our. Uh, it's gonna st still be above our skid plates and cross member, and we get a little more oil capacity to help keep everything cool. So we just made the modifications to the windage tray. Holly sends instructions right here, depending on your pan, the F body pan there and then there's the standard full length there. So you have to cut that out, clean it up, bolt that back in, and get our new pan installed. So with this oil pan, Holly took it one step further. Not only are they making LS Swap oil pans, but they also now have them as an off-road oil pan, which you can incorporate a pre-built skid plate into. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of, first off, trying to build your own skid plate, which can be pretty difficult. And like on Cassie's Jeep, like the LJ, there's plenty of companies that make oil pan skid plates, but that's designed around the factory engine. By the time you put a you know, LS in there, none of the factory oil pan skid plates are going to fit. So this actually incorporates into our oil pan has bosses for the mounting, which is really neat. This is 3 16 Typically, this probably would be enough, but since this is going to be a king of the hammers rig, we're gonna bolt this up and see if we can weld some more plates onto this just to make it one more step of bomb proof. As you can tell, we have the entire crew up here. I don't know if they're necessarily helping, but they're doing something. Today is officially the last day of 2023. This past year has been full of some really cool projects, a lot of great experiences, a lot of challenges, shoulder injury, but we're going into the new year nice and strong. We're good to go. The race Jeep is looking fantastic. We still have a lot of work to go. This is a Holley 10 micron filter. It's what they recommend for the EFI applications, and it's super easy to change out. So we have this nice billet mount actually two different mounts, but to undo the filter, you don't have to take all four tabs off. You just have to loosen these little tension clamps and slide your filter out. So this is actually going to go in front of the fuel cell on the firewall back here. So let's get this on, get that knocked out, and then start tackling some of these other projects. And hopefully none of these projects carry on into the new year. So there's been a lot of stuff happening in the shop, guys. So many little projects like this that it's it's hard to film them all because first off we're in a time crunch we have i'd like to be out to king of the hammers on by january 20th with this thing tested so this next week week and a half there's all the small details on putting this jeep together and making sure they're done correctly i'm trying to cover as much content as i can but at this point with a rig like this if you can make it this far all of these little things should be pretty easy. And I wanna show you guys what all goes into the uh, race Jeep, but unfortunately, we're about a month or two behind because of the shoulder surgery and the, you know, the, the damage I did to my shoulder. Luckily, it's all healed up. Only thing I need to do is kind of regain my strength. Shoulder still looks crazy. There's a nice lump here, but the doctor gave me a good to go. They put it back together as best they could. So unfortunately, I just, looks like I still have a broken collarbone, but mechanically everything works in there. So, you know, if, if, if it wasn't for the shoulder surgery, we'd probably have a built rig by now. That was the goal was to have it done 
you know, early December, but the shoulder happened back in September, August, September, October, November. It took about two months. Heater just kicked on. It's getting cold in here. Let's get this fuel filter mount. So according to Ultra 4 rules, we do have to have an aluminum or steel roof. There is a spec for the minimum thickness, but what this is ultimately doing is covering the gaps above our head. In case of a rollover, you don't have a rock going between your V-bars and you know protruding through to the cap. Out of Hand Fab was able to make this for us and this turned out sick. So all we gotta do to secure this down is do some trick tabs with you know threads in them. We're gonna go underneath, make sure this is all perfectly lined up, and then drill holes, weld the trick tabs on, and we have our roof done. But as you can tell, they found this curve almost perfectly from half a country away, so, or ha across the country. But by the time we uh, suck this down with bolts, it'll be nice and flush. So this is a great looking roof. Lots of aluminum on this Jeep, just to cut down a little bit on weight. But this is a fine piece, let's get it on. The antenna is on, it's mounted right in the center of the top. So for your antenna, you put on a ground plane like this, centered is the best uh, for a ground plane. You're gonna get a longer reach. I actually went a little bit back. It looked a little more goofy up front there, but that is in. We are gonna have a spare antenna mounted um, over here on the side. That way, if something happens to that one, we can grab it, put it back in. The Baja Designs chase light is in. You can barely even see it back there, so it's super sleek. I cut off these, uh, cut off the top tabs. Cut off the excess, so this chase light, it actually has channels in there, so the bolt head slides in there, and you can move it around, but we have a rubber washer to help a little bit of vibration isolation, and then uh, serrated flange nuts up top there, so shouldn't vibrate free, but he is gonna just chop so it looks a little bit better. They're actually called Neo washers, and it's a stainless impregnated rubber washer. Who impregnated it? The, the Neo. Made our official track bar earlier this morning. So the one that we had over there is inch and a half quarter wall tube. We had out of hand fab make us a much beefier track bar. It's one and five eighths um, with a thicker wall. Inside diameter, it's still one inch, but this is heavy wall tubing and as you can tell, they put a bend in it with the measurements I gave them because we don't have a die for one and five eighths tubing and I didn't feel like going out and buying it just for one bend. So they've been super helpful between the roof. We have rock sliders on the way, custom made for all of our frame mounts on there. They're weld on, so those will be here soon. The track bar, those guys have been pumping out some really, really nice work and custom work at that. So huge shout out to the guys at Out of Hand Fab for saving us a bunch of time trying to make this stuff. We don't, we don't have the time. So finding a company that can, you know, do custom work and actually put super quality products out that are custom is hard to find.
got a leaky jug. Recap on today's projects. Started off kind of all over the place. These window nets look fantastic. I don't know if I've shown you guys yet, but these are from White Safety. They are right down the road here in Oklahoma City. They're able to make SFI spec window nets. So window nets is a huge topic uh, and something to plan for. If I didn't have whites down the road, this might not have happened. Uh, we would have probably been screwed. So we had to go, I had to go, make multiple trips uh, with him to design these things. Now there are other companies that you can send a template to, like PRP for example. PRP makes amazing stuff. You send them a template on how you want this made, mail it off to them, they make it, send it back. Now if you are like us in a crunch for KOH, there's no way you're getting them in time because there's a ton of racers sending them in. Now when we're doing a crazy design like this, I had, like I said, I had to make multiple trips and that's because we really had to figure out how to do this. So the main thing we're looking out for is, uh, there we go, is our detachable portion, our portion down here that's like static, it stays. Now Ultra 4 does prefer to have the latch on the bottom. That way if the latch mechanism fails, it defaults down and it doesn't flip down. So like on our case, if somehow one of these welds broke, the net would fall down. So what they like to see is Top fixed, bottom removable, but it is not a requirement. They just say they think recommend it or prefer it. Contoured our sidebar right here. Pretty much made the entire thing a window net. These are the all-star performance window net little tabs and grommet kit. And technically all we really need to do is to prevent this from moving more than fit four inches in and out. I think it's actually just in. So it's nice and snug, he made it perfect. We added a few magnet tabs here just to prevent this from flapping around at high speeds and a little Velcro strap up here just to prevent that from flopping. The brake lines, we have one soft line coming down under there, going to a T and running over to the axle. First brake lines that we had made here at Oklahoma Hose had a slight leak at the taper. So these are the first ones, custom made, but this just wasn't sealing correctly. It's the right flare, something wasn't right with them. So we were chasing leaks all morning, trying to figure out if it was the block fitting, the T fitting, or the line, and swapped it all around, and it turned out to be the line. So that took a lot longer than expected. I was hoping to be done with brake lines at like eight this morning. But brake lines are done. We actually had to make a pitman arm skid, and this is the second design of our pitman arm skid. So at first we didn't have this tube in here. We had quarter inch plate, gusset on the side, and I don't know if you can tell, but there are three gussets inside there to prevent this from bending back if we hit a rock. Now the reason for this is we stretched the pitman, we, we stretched the whole steering box forward, and you can see our pitman arms right there. So if we came up against a rock and smashed our pitman arm, that would be a very bad day. And before we added this, we were thinking, man, if we smash into this and it bends back, then we lose our steering completely because the pitman arm would hit the skin. So to beef it up, just so it won't bend at all, added some 125 uh, tubing, notched it, slid it up in there, and then added another one up top there, and it's capped and everything. Air pumper attachments are on, so we mounted the air pumper. Wow, it is dark in here. All right, no, there we go. So, mounted the air pumper. It came with these brackets, or I actually bought those. They're made for like a flat panel, but it worked perfectly. We passed the bolts through into the perfor uh, perforated steel. And all we gotta do is put a little spacer in between there. But honestly, it's, it's actually really, really solid. Ran our lines, they're just zip tied, and welded our weld on block up here for our magnetic quick release. Our helmets both have the air attachment on the left side so they're both kind of offset for an easy to reach area to throw them up in there. And as you can tell, under the roof, we put some trim just to cut down on any rattling and it is nice and quiet now. You know, typically when you have 
you know, they're all actually very nice. A lot of the times you'll get a ton of rattles on things like this when you have aluminum bolted onto steel, you know, the trick tabs. And I need to add one more in the back corner just to suck that gap down. The seats, everything's done. We just got to bolt them in. We have our seat belt tabs, one right here, other one right here, and our center crotch belt right here. So those just need to get popped on. Uh, our, our coolant and fuel hoses pass through under our little dash bar right there. It was a tricky one because we have to have some type of shielding over any type of liquid hoses that pass through. And you can't wrap it. It needs to be almost like a watertight compartment. So all that is, is four inch intake tubing that we're actually using for intake. It's like the U-Fit Flowmaster intake. And we stuffed it all in there. They're held in with uh, couplers and clamps. So it's watertight, it's going to work. And it takes up a lot less space than building a big box or a full dash across here. And that's what I didn't, I didn't want to have to get into doing an aluminum dash that went all the way up to the firewall. So this works. We are going to uh, band the rear back there soon, but that passes up. And then our fuel line goes over to the fuel rail, across the fuel rail, back up here into our re regulator. So on EFI setups, the regulator's on the return side of the fuel system, and then it goes down back through there into the tank. So we were hoping to have the fuel system tested today, uh, just hook up direct battery power to the fuel pumps and disconnect it from the fuel rail, flush everything out from the hoses, whatever you have new AN hoses. There is a ton of black stuff in those that you don't wanna send to your injectors. So pop off the supply, kick your pumps on, flow it into a bucket, get rid of that fuel, that we don't trash your injectors. We were hoping to do that today, check for leaks, set the fuel pressure, Make sure everything is good fuel system wise before we start running electric and getting this thing up and running. So realistically, we are a few days away from firing this up uh, once we start running electronics and whatnot. But before we get to that, tonight's project is the rock sliders. So we need a very beefy set of rock rails or rock sliders, whatever you wanna call them for this because we are going to be landing on these a ton. Now the issue is we don't have time or we didn't have time to build a custom set of rock sliders and I am not a rock slider professional. Now the guys over at Out of Hand Fab make a fantastic looking and super strong setup for the JK. Now the issue is we lowered the body and we stretched the wheelbase as well as kind of extending the body with the armor here. So the guys over at Out of Hand Fab, like I mentioned, did a custom roof and they also made us a custom set of rock sliders using the exact same specs. You know, this is the same tubing, same design as their JK sliders. These are weld on and they made a few small tweaks for us. We took a bunch of measurements, made a few small tweaks to make this work with our setup. So we have our front leg, our rear leg, and then our back leg is unwelded so we can position it exactly where we want, which in our case is going to be right about there. So we're not at that point yet. We had to, or we're gonna have to notch out this front part because where this lands, there's our alignment hole, where that lands on the frame is actually right where our cage mount is. And all we have to do is cut off about a quarter of an inch, test fit this, and then weld these onto the frame. Uh, before these go on, I need to get our rocker aluminum skids on. But this side, as you can tell, that happened down in South Padre a while ago when this thing was still stock. So we're going to try to cover it up. But in order to install the rib nuts and everything, I want to make sure we get those on before we weld the sliders on. But the way they design these, the lower tube is 175 quarter inch wall, which is an extremely thick, heavy wall tubing. The top is 175, 120 wall, which is an eighth inch wall. So most of the 
actual rock bashing is going to be on the heavy wall tube. Up here, it just really braces it all together. So we cut a little bit of weight down by running a thinner wall tubing up top. We also have these nice gussets built in. The corners are saddle gusseted. This thing is a super strong rock slider. Another day, another project. We are moving on to power distribution and wiring. So the past week we have been just killing it, knocking out all kinds of projects on the rig, skid plates, rock sliders, all the last minute details, putting it together. We finished up the steering, a uh, little double shear brackets, the DOM tubing that slides in there. We didn't raise the tie rod up too much just because this gets extremely busy in here at full stuff. And, Honestly, with it already being over the drag link, should be good to go. But here, Mike fabbed this up yesterday. A little double shear bracket that ties our drag link into the, uh, the little sleeve for the high steer and knuckle on the tie rod. So this steering, super beefy. We shouldn't have any issues with this whatsoever. But back to what I was talking about, wiring and power distribution. Now, before we actually start worrying about wiring and hooking up electronics and whatnot, it's important to have a good power distribution system throughout the Jeep. And what I mean by that is the heavy gauge wiring, your grounds, your main 12 volts, and how it's gonna run in the Jeep. You wanna knock that out first before you start hooking up wires and everywhere. Pretty much this is the, the framework of the electrical system. And we'll, we'll start on the rear. Here's what we've got going on so far. So batteries are mounted in the rear which means we do have quite a distance to go. So we stepped up to a two watt wire, which can add up fast, but luckily we have a Spectro wire here in town, which really cuts down the cost and makes it easy hooking up all of our electrical systems. So we have two batteries, full throttle batteries. I think they're around 850 cold cranking amps. Talked about these in a few videos back. Not sure if I've gotten around to editing it or whatnot. We have two of them running them in parallel, as you can see, positive to positive, negative to negative. Puts them in parallel, which actually doubles the amperage. If you put them in series, it would make 24 volts. So we have each battery ground going to ground on the frame. And to do that, use the Barnes four wheel drive, threaded weld washers, half by 20, one over here and one over there, giving us a nice, solid, strong connection for the frame ground. From there, we are going to run it forward onto our firewall posts, which I'll show you here in a minute, and we are working on the positive. So there's a lot of neat little tricks, like this is a double-ended terminal. Instead of you know stacking terminal ends on this bolt, this actually shares it, and this is going to run up forward. So the Jeep's in there, this might be a little hard to show you, but our firewall pass through into the cab. It's pretty dark back there, but we have two firewall pass-through cables. Now what you really wanna watch out for in the power distribution systems like this is the maximum amp draw that you're gonna see. So what would happen if we ran one two watt cable all the way forward, powering all of our electronics, our starter, our winch, that's a ton of amperage going through one cable, through all the connections, and it's super easy to burn up a wire. So what we've done is kind of separated, separated the systems. So our main power going forward for the winch, starter, and feed for the alternator coming back is snaked through the frame right here. So this is going to go directly to the battery, snakes through the frame, and we actually stuffed dash 12 cable in there so it doesn't chafe inside the frame. Comes out of the frame here, P-clipped, nice and secure, to a stud terminal there, and from here it piggybacks to the starter, piggybacks up to the winch, and our alternator feeds to that. Now on the inside of the frame here, we also have our forward ground post, another Barnes four wheel drive, half by 20 weld washer directly into the frame. And so on that, we have our engine block ground, our winch ground, and our alternator ground as well. So with all of this, that's one circuit. The firewall pass through is going to be all of our electronics. So running our Holly, our, you know, which is our ECM, our Switch Pros unit to control our, all of our off-road lights, air compressor and whatnot. So we have kind of two different primary electrical 
circuits or power distribution centers. Stuff takes a lot of work and this is something that you don't want to skimp on. You want your electrical system to be top notch. Everything needs to be secure because all it takes is losing one leg of power, one cable, either shorting out, cause a fire or just end your race right there. And everything should be in a spot that's easy to see, check and troubleshoot. So I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. We also have to have an e-stop system. So right here we have a remote battery switch because when you're racing, you have to have an e-stop, which doesn't necessarily have to kill the entire electrical system, but it needs to shut off your engine, your fans, really anything that an e-stop should operate. So in our, in, our, in our case, it's going to kill the ignition system, which kills everything for the engine to run. Now all of our GPS units, the winch, all of that stuff can work. But when you're planning out an electrical system, it's a little bit difficult and we'll talk about this later and how we're going to do it. But you gotta be careful that your alternator isn't back feeding somewhere to where your e-stop doesn't work. Because if you just ran, for example, if we ran all of our posts through the interior here, and we had our alternator feeding that block and that block was also feeding the Holly ECU. You could hit the e-stop, which would kill the battery power, but the alternator would back feed and continue powering it even if the e-stop was disconnected from that point. So there's a lot of little things to do this wiring correctly and also not have to have 15 cables going forward and back and just creating a ton of, ton of pass-throughs, a lot of unneeded weight and a system that's entirely hard to troubleshoot. So keeping it simple, keeping it safe, and really so far the results are turning out pretty professional. Oh, the term professional is pretty funny. So a lot of uh, who are the who are the pros, you know? So according to Ultra 4 rules, we have to have three fire extinguishers, one inside the cab, two outside the cab, or one five pound extinguisher outside of the cab. So went with three H3R Performance, two and a half pound max out extinguishers. These are super neat. They are rechargeable. So if you do have to use your fire extinguisher, you can go get it refilled or you can send it back to them. You don't have to buy a whole new extinguisher. These are also ABC rated. It's a dry chemical. That way if you have to put out fires and you douse your electrical system, you don't have to worry about it being caustic, eating your wires, disintegrating your fuel hoses and all that. This is the way to go if you are going to be running a fire extinguisher in your rig, which you should because you know everybody's seen the videos of people's Jeeps going up in flames and it's, it's a sad sight to see having a fire extinguisher might not stop the fire, but it's better to have one and not need it than to need it and not have one. And we are mounting it to the panel with a ProLock quick release. So they have these for flat panel mounts, roll bar mounts. They also sell Jeep specific mounts for the JLs under the seats, roll bar mounts of various sizes, the list goes on. So this is going to go right between the driver and passenger seat onto our panel in here. So let's hop up and show you the game plan. It's actually a really easy mount to install, but I want to make sure we can mount this first, have ample room for our wire pass-throughs down there and ample room in there. So I'm gonna square this up, just center it right in here. We have to drill four holes to mount 
our bracket. It's a little hard to do this one-handed, but in order to get it off the firewall, you just pull this red tab and off she goes. Super quick, super easy, and very convenient to have a fire extinguisher pop off like that. There's a one tap. It is time to go ahead and get our ECU and wiring harness installed on the engine since we're working on electric. What we're running is the Holly HP. This ECU is a lot strong, not stronger, but it's resistant. It's more resistant to vibration, water resistant compared to the Terminator. And this is a little more well built for racing. But what we're doing tonight is installing the actual engine harness onto the engine. That way we can figure out where we're gonna put the ECU, where we're gonna run the power harness. So we have the power harness, our injector harness, O2 sensor, and the engine harness here. So we're gonna set the camera up, hopefully knock this out pretty quick. It's already like, it's like, it, what time is it? It's 10 o'clock right now. Because everything has like a label, every, every connection says what it's for. It's so. a super easy install. We just gotta <laughs> make sure we route it good, make sure nothing's gonna get burnt, chafed, any of that. So we're gonna take our time installing this, but like she said, it's all, it's all labeled. My project for tonight is our electrical panel in here. So we have the Holly HP and we're gonna piggyback anything that needs a relay from this. So the, the fuel pumps, fans. It's gonna come over here to our MSD solid state relay. Now the really cool thing about this, a lot of this is solid state stuff. Solid state means it's, you don't have to deal with the big clunky relays. Here we go, I'll show you. So like, for example, this isn't solid state. We have our relays and fuses right there. Those have a shorter lifespan. They aren't as good in very hot climates and high vibration areas. Now the idea on this board, this is uh, but it is going to insulate this and also kind of absorb any of those micro vibrations from transferring to the ECU and all of this. Now we do have rubber foot pads on our ECU here, but back to what I was saying, this MSD solid state relay kit. This makes it super simple to wire stuff up. We have our trigger wires here and then our outputs. And the great thing about this is they are all high current, 35 amps per channel. Over here, this is kind of the backup, the non-solid state I was showing you. This is just a uh, two relay channel, but instead of having long relay harnesses flopping around, we can secure it to the board and have a nice clean relay and fuse set up right there for whatever we want. Plus we have the solid state switch pros that incorporates relays, fuses, and a switch box all into one. So all of this is mounted up here through some battery uh, posts, positive and negative on here, just in case we need to tap into uh, more power for other units. But this is ready to get installed back into the firewall on the Jeep and we're gonna be putting some spacers behind it and some rubber washers. Now, before we get to that point, I wanna show you guys what we've done on the electrical system up to this point. So we're running dual batteries in parallel grounds are going both to the frame both batteries have a frame ground then it goes up to our rear firewall pass through so we used a nice bulkhead pass through connector right here so our hot is coming in 12 volts goes up to our remote activated e-stop or battery disconnect we also have to have a source of 12 volt constant power to feed this thing to switch it so we have both of those piggybacking off fuse right here for our disconnect service, Deutsch connector to make replacing this easy if we ever have to, hot coming in, hot going out to our ignition panel right over here. So 
if we hit our e-stop, so right now without the e-stop on, we have 12 volts flowing through here and down to our ignition panel. Now I tied in 12 volts from the lead of our start right here. So it's feeding through that red wire coming up here and then it taps into here. So the 12 volt stops here and it doesn't continue back to our e-stop. Now when I press this, it closes the circuit, sending 12 volts through that switch and that's going to open this, which means disconnect it, which means the 12 volts will stop flowing. Everything that is this forward, such as our ignition panel, our switch pros, all of that will be disconnected. Anything that we need to leave on, we're just gonna simply leave hooked up to here. So your GPS, radios, any of that stuff that doesn't need to be disconnected, can stay on this post and feed forward. Everything that needs to have an emergency stop or be shut off with that switch is going to be on the output. A lot of people, you know, either go way underprotected on the electrical system or they go way overprotected and they have fuses and relays and spots where it's not needed and it just becomes a jumbled mess. And if you're trying to troubleshoot it, it's almost impossible. You know, people have four different wires going four different ways from one source. It gets very, very messy. And the last thing you need to do is be in the dark out in a race scenario or the woods with your Jeep, trying to troubleshoot, figuring out why something isn't gonna start. And you have to dig through a loom full of wires to find out what actually caused it. So keeping everything nice and clean, here's our Switch Pros, the switches right here, and our air pumper adjustable. It's actually just like a potentiometer to control how much air comes out of our air pumper into our helmets. But we still have to hook all of this up. So our main focus for today, or tonight, is to get our panel mounted up in here, run all of the Holly, the ECU wires, make everything nice and clean under there, and run power from our ignition panel to the Holly and start working the magic there. And for the Holly ECU power, we're gonna be run it through this nice little uh, bulkhead connector too. So we can run two sets through here. Top one's gonna be the Holly. The lower one is probably, I don't know, either the Switch Pros or something else. But everything is coming along really good. Still a ton of work to go. I'm gonna stop talking. I spent the day wiring and we are not completely done, but we are at the testing stage. So I ran all the wires and everything here is somewhat temporary. So, I mean, this big bundle of wires under here is the Switch Pros. We're not gonna keep all of those leads. We're only gonna use what we need and we're gonna clean that up. But all the power wires from our e-stop run under our dash and you can kind of see what I do is zip tie each run kind of as I go or a couple bundle of wires. That way, whenever I'm mocking this up, I can make sure everything fits. And then at the end, we'll cut this, we'll run a big protective sleeve over all of these and zip tie it or secure it in a different way. But everything is mounted there on the firewall. At this point, really to run the Jeep, all you would need is ignition on and start. These are all blank with the exception of this last one, which is our number two fuel pumps. We actually are running the dual in-tank pump from Holly. Having, which means we have two pumps. The Holly HP is able to control one fuel pump, so whenever you turn on the ignition, Holly's gonna turn on the fuel pump, prime it for like five seconds, you start it, then it runs it. Now, if that pump goes bad, we have a backup pump here. So, what we did today was wire everything up. The e-stop does work, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll show you that. So, you could either stop it by that, or at a brightly red, color, which they want to see, and this actually kills everything in here. And what that does, I'll press the button, one, two, three. Yep, so it clicks. To reset it, you turn off the power, undo your e-stop, and relatch it down. And we're back in business, but this pump is super quiet. Turn on, you can't even really hear it. I can, but you can't. A lot of the external fuel pumps for racing, they are super loud, super whiny, but good news is, and then I'll show you E-Stop, kills it, kills the fuel pump too. So super neat, not that hard to wire up. I do say that, but in reality, uh, a lot of people have issues with wiring. This, this was probably a day, a day and a half job up here in the shop, but luckily the experience and 
kind of everything I've learned working on boats and cars and ships and all that really, really helps out and makes this a lot easier. Before I forget what all of those wires are, where they're at, we are going to label all of our wires. Fingers crossed, this is the first startup. I'm a little bit, I'm actually very nervous. Very, very nervous. It's gonna work. So we just got a little bit of a fire. Not, not like a fire like that, but the engine actually kind of turned over. I think we might have a hard time because right now our fuel pressure is only at 27 PSI. Uh, we can kick on the secondary fuel pump and it only bumps up to 34, 37. So we need to actually uh, increase the pressure on our fuel rail with our adjustable regulator because it's not going to, uh, it's not gonna run right with that low of a PSI. So before we keep trying to start this thing, our, uh, our regulator's here, so all we gotta do is break this jam nut and uh, raise or lower this to uh, change our fuel pressure. Hopefully put it around 60 PSI. Loosen our jam nut, and what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and rotate it clockwise. One full turn, 46 PSI. Let's do another round, 56. And now that we're bumping up the pressure a little bit, it is important to uh, check for leaks again. So I'll just do a quarter turn. And we're gonna lock this down. Cause that should be close enough to at least get this thing to start. <laughs> we are very, very close. Wow. down there probably from the oil cooler but she sounds healthy 50 pounds of oil pressure right there but what this is is our outputs are these four posts here each one can be up to 35 amps so we have our number one fuel pump on our red wire number two fuel pump number one fan and our number two fan now to control that we have these tiny trigger wires right here so off the main harness here is an input output connector now now it does come pre-wired with one green wire to control the fuel pump so that's this green wire right here the second one are these two fans which were uh used on this input and output harness you have to buy this separately but you go to the pin out see which one is able to do what you want to do and i'll show you that on the computer here but those go up and go to there on our trigger wires so that is going to encompass kind of your traditional relay and fuse block all into one which is super simple so under this you can see that output number one which is pin b12 and P pin uh, b11 is our electric fan one and our electric fan two and we're about to create a third output for that two channel relay for our trans cooler fan and finally down here is going to be the oil cooler fan once we get to that our inputs uh, the trans temp input and all that is is a resistance sensor, a, uh, like a, a thermistor kind, and that, you know, you set it up all through here into the uh, Holly software, and what we can do is view what actually happens with this. So now we're on the input outputs. All right, so we're going to go over here to the system, which looks like the little Holly computer. We're going to go down basic input outputs, and as you can tell, it's already set up. So electric fans, fan number one and fan number two. Go ahead and click both of those and just pretty much put on what temperatures you want them to come on at. There's a lot to this, um, and I'm sure there's videos out there on how to set this up. But we're gonna go back here to the inputs, outputs. Our input, I've set this one up, trans temp. So coming into the computer, we have that uh, thermistor. You just need to route uh, the sensor ground and the sensor input. I think on my sensor, it's green and white. Those tie into the input harness, and I tied those in onto the uh, A12 
uh, you actually only do one of the wires. The green one goes into the Holly system and the white one, which is the ground, ties into the power tap, which is like the reference sensor grounding system on the Holly. So you tie both of those in, you're gonna enable it and then we configure it. So over here, um, there's some options if you have like a specific type of sensor that you bought, but I just went down to custom therm. We want that in Fahrenheit. Uh, sensor minimum, whenever you buy a sensor, it tells you the minimum and maximum. So now the neat thing is that's our input. It's gonna send it to our dash so we can read our trans temp, but we can also have things happen with our input. So we go over here to where used and it is in use as the following. Trans cooler fan, sensor input trigger. So I'm gonna press okay and I'm gonna go to outputs and I'm going to look at our trans cooler fan. So we're gonna configure what that input is going to output. So sensor input is number one. This output will activate when the trans temp input is above 180 and we can change that. So you can also have above or below. And as you can tell, you can choose your inputs or any other preset setting in the Holly software. You know, since we don't have a switch, we can't just flip a switch and test it. We have to kind of electronically tell it to uh, make a rule for it. So we are in our outputs here and I changed it to, uh, so this output will activate when the trans temp input sensor is above 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are going to send those changes to the ECU. And the fan just kicked on. Cool. So that tells me that the wiring works, the sensors work. Um, I'll go back in and change it to 180 degrees. But just like that, whenever the sensor hits that certain threshold that we programmed into the system, electronically, it's gonna hit the relay and do what it needs to do. Oh yeah, those things move some air. I, I finished buttoning up all the uh, engine wiring and we started working on spring swaps from AccuTune. So ended up going with stiffer springs. Uh, Cassie's up here helping. We're swapping to what, 200 over 300 in the front and 200 over 250 in the rear. Is that right? Sure. So we pulled them off, putting the new uh, springs on and then we're gonna do one last kind of flex and full bump check with the coilovers out, so. You know, we added a lot more weight than originally anticipated. Not, not a bad thing, it's just got to account for it with new springs. So we're gonna pop these on. One final check at full bump. On the bump stops. My GoPro is at 25 seconds until I am out of storage. So at this point, we are gonna go ahead and prep our connector. White is going to be the LED, the bright. Black is ground and green is our turn signal in case we wanna incorporate that. 10 seconds left. I'm gonna run down to the house in a little bit, get all the files off here. In the meantime, I'm gonna get this prepped with our removable connector and on the Jeep.
stayed up pretty late, torquing everything down, making sure this is good for a shake down, shake down run out at crossbar. So I'm gonna fix that vent line. I am happy with how this looked, how it looks. This is just fantastic, but it's time Pull it out of the garage, load it up on the trailer, and uh, it is freezing outside today, guys. It's this morning, out at crossbar is 16. Right now it's like 25. We don't have doors or any of that. So I might throw the core doors on just to keep us a little bit warmer. But I gotta put the GoPro down, bomb out there. We're not making a full wheeling day, but maybe get a few clips of this thing in action out there. it for this video and pretty much it for the series we still have a few more videos to catch up on you know breaking down the race showing you guys the race footage but other than that thank you all for watching it's been a great experience i've had a ton of fun doing this and who knows maybe eventually we'll make another king of the hammers rig or a different class rig but for now i think the race videos are probably going to be put on pause for a little bit there's a lot of catching up i need to do with the other jeeps the gladiator needs a ton of projects the JKU with the Hemi needs a ton of projects. Cassie's Jeep needs a lot of work. So there's a lot of stuff that I had to put off, put on hold for the past year while we built this and it's time to bring those things back in, get some other projects going, some other video reviews, and of course, just take these things out and have some fun. So thanks for watching. Please give the video a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys in the next video.